The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Cue Points. Welcome back to I Come Alive, stories of Black Gay Atlanta nightlife. I am your host, DJ Sir Daniel. This series strives to tell the stories of Atlanta's gay nightlife from the perspective of the people who lived it. Our feature guest for this episode is a reluctant leader, as most pioneers are. Mashawn D. Simon has the distinction of being an OG peach holder, for he is Atlanta born and Decatur raised. He has a unique story of duality. How does one answer the call of the Almighty and still enjoy being black and queer in Atlanta? You'll soon find out. Enjoy the show. You have the distinction of being the only Georgia born and bred subject that I've spoken to so far on this project. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's a big deal because as a native son of Atlanta, like what grade would you give your city for its treatment of its black and queer citizens? Oh, wow. What grade would I give? You know, it's, hmm. What grade would I, is this like on a normal scale of like A to like B or? Yeah, just kidding. You okay. can give it, or we can do uh, E, S, and, and U, excellent, satisfactory, unsatisfactory, whatever you want to do, teacher. S-A- yes, exactly. <laughs> whatever you want to do, professor. <laughs> um, I would say that where we are now, as it pertains to the city and what's available to those who identify as black and queer, however you line up on that. So, um, I would give the city a C. I think the city does really well around being somewhat inclusive um, politically for the LGBTQIA community at large. But I think when it comes, and what I mean by that is the ways in which it protects um, the overall community in a lot of ways, especially when we think about like Midtown, 14th Street, et cetera, et cetera, um, in support for gay pride in the city, et cetera, and the ways in which businesses come together. But I think when it comes down to those of us who are also black and brown, um, I cannot say that the city has done or the city has invested as much energy, commitment, care, and concern for us what we need, what we want, and what's available to us compared to the community at large. Mm -hmm. I will say, though, that what I find to be interesting is that this project that you were doing, um, there seems to be this trend. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, maybe it was about a year ago, I participated in these conversations that the city of Atlanta were doing about Black Gay Atlanta and the history of Black Gay Atlanta, and I found that to be intriguing. Um, and so I think there is something happening where there are certain people in certain spaces with, or with a certain amount of access that are bringing this conversation to life. And I do appreciate that. Um, but those pockets are few and far between. Hmm. So let's put a pin in that because we're going to come back around to, um, black gay Atlanta, the treatment of this, the city as a whole, um, yeah. I do find it is rare that we do run into someone that is a native of the city. So how do you feel? And we're going to get to our main topic, but how do you feel when you see those disparaging comments about Atlanta, knowing that most of the people living here are transplants now, you know, we love that saying Atlanta is not a real place. (laughs) And at times it is, it is mythological at times. It does go, (laughs) you feel like, okay, are we in Oz right now? But yes. How do you feel yeah. about more so the yeah. disparaging comments about the city of Atlanta, whether it's about the infrastructure, um, traffic, or the fact that there is a such a large and visible black gay community here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I tend to I tend to take it personal in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I I have taken notice as to lately. This has actually happened a few days ago where a colleague of mine who lives in San Juan, Puerto Rico, every time, um, according to him, people from Atlanta visit 
San Juan, like he, he, he claims that he just knows that they are people from Atlanta. Like he's like, I know that these are Atlanta Negroes for these reasons, dot, dot, dot. And I'm always like, no, stop. Cause one, all of us are not like that. And I, and you can add whatever the stereotypes you want to add to that. Um, but two, as you said, a lot of the people who now claim Atlanta were not born here. Like there are not that many natives still living in the metro area. Um, I used to joke and say, I, and I know this to be true because I feel like I'm related to most of them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm just still finding more and more family as I get older, but, uh, yeah, like I find myself taking it jokingly and subtly personal, um, because I think it is slightly unfair that all of these things are tacked on to my city, um, from the perspective of someone. Now, let me be very clear. And I always did this. I'm Atlanta born and Decatur bred, um, because my family was adamant about raising me, um, in a different kind of environment. And so a part of that is in my DNA, like I am a Decatur boy, mm -hmm. um, but I still claim Atlanta proudly because I was born in this city. I, um, have been greatly influenced by this city politically, economically, socially, culturally. Um, and so I like to take ownership of the fact that I am one of the big few who are still here. And it's funny you bring up claiming, you know, how Atlanta has influenced you socially. As long as you and I have known each other, and that's been for a minute now, as long as you and I have known each other, you really haven't been much, haven't been one for going out a lot. And so I'm wondering how has like the pursuit of the titles that I named, that I rattled off earlier, like the pursuit of those titles, how have they informed your connection to the gay scene here in Atlanta? Um, well, yeah, I, I, I was many of them. I was a club kid. I went to the Bulldogs and the tracks and, uh, and the phase ones, and I went to the Loretta's. I've been to the Marquette once. I survived. I never <laughs> want to go back again. Um, I think we have to go back as adults just to just to 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 gauge the amount of growth our growth and the the growth of the marquette because i think the marquette People still fighting against abs in there well but see here's the thing i think there's still a place <laughs> there's a place for not necessarily the stabbing <laughs> and, and, the, and the being dragged out on the streets but there is a place for that that segment, that demographic of the community to feel seen and to have a space for them as well. And I think I it, and I think it is something to, it's also a way that we gauge ourselves and, you know, how far we've come. Cause I haven't been there since 1995, 96. So oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't even remember when I went to be quite honest. I just know I've been in there once. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this is what this is. Noted. I never have to come back here again. I wonder how much the fact that it was co-ed, like it was very much, it was uh, unspoken, like this is not just for you boys. Mm -hmm. This is also for the lesbians, the mm -hmm. the studs, especially when when I was going and it was on, right there by the AUC across the street from that yep. McDonald's. Um, yep. Job Corps had a headquarters here in Atlanta at that time. And so a lot of the young ladies, the studs, the, the young and budding studs <laughs> that used to go to um, Job Corps would come to, jo I mean, would come to the Marquette and frequent the Marquette. And they kind of outnumbered the boys as it were, you they know. Did. They so... Did. Mm -hmm. There's a lot yeah. to be said for that environment, but you were saying about how the scene and your pursuit of your dreams, your goals, how, how did one inform the other? Like, did you find yeah. at one point you were like, okay, can't do this as much as anymore because I'm concentrating on this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's very true. That is very, and, and I was having a conversation with someone recently about this. Um, my, my husband and I have just recently celebrated 10 years together and Congratulations. Uh, conversation. thank you. 
there was a conversation being had with one of my ministry colleagues out of North Carolina about how rare that is seen in our community. And, and I, and that it caused me to go down this rabbit hole of a lot of the choices I made for a lot of different reasons as it pertained to, as you said, the, the, the levels of status I was chasing. And I was that young man who had been conditioned to believe that, um, you had to be presented in a certain kind of way, respectability politics. You had to operate a certain kind of way. You had to lose a certain way. Um, and so when I started seminary, um, back in 2010, um, I like to say that my life, my nightlife ended in that moment. Um, I had been, you know, hanging out with my people, going to Bulldogs, going to um, the spots. Um, I remember the days of going to the palace. I remember the days of phase one. I remember the days of all of those moments. Um, but when I decided to surrender to what I perceived to be a call on my life to ministry, um, I chose to submit to this idea that people in ministry didn't need to be in certain spaces and the club, one of the spaces that we did not need to be in. Um, when I started preaching regularly, um, when I started pastoring, um, all of that came to an abrupt end. I would still every now and again, do like a first Friday at the Eagle, um, mm -hmm. with certain people. Um, when my now husband and I got together, there were a couple of times where he and I went as a couple or when family of his was in town for like a pride, uh, a black gay pride weekend or, or, or Labor Day weekend, we would go. So first Friday experience, but yeah, I completely stopped doing all of that because it was perceived that that was not something, um, for someone of my factor to be doing, unless, um, I was going to be what a lot of people call it, not my city sisters. So if I, I went out of town. Oh, and, I was, yeah. I was just about to bring yeah. that up. It was like, do you, so yeah. do you, were you one of the ones that you felt you could, you could let down your hair in another city because. Yeah. That's what we would see here in Atlanta. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, I became a not my city sissy. <laughs> a not my city sissy. And but, I will say that you, you and, and Elvis, your husband, have always um, would come out for events that I was a part of. Like if I cool. would be spinning at a, at, at a Bulldogs for, like you said, for Pride Weekend, Yes, you guys would come out and support me. And I always appreciated that because I was well aware of your journey. And yeah. it's funny that you have that kind of conflict within yourself about you see a friend on a journey and you're like, well, it's not that serious. You know, he could he could do such and such. He could come out. And yeah. but then you don't realize you have to take into consideration that people are really on their life's paths and you need to and we have to respect that and i yeah, and yeah. that only comes with growth and you know getting older yeah. and and just living life because as i step away from nightlife you know and not being a part of it as much as i did mostly because you know g growing older and things starting to change or be the same and you know you trying to you don't really feel like you fit in anymore um do you deal with that of the aging out thoughts of, you know, nightlife, is that a thing for you? Do you feel like you feel like you've aged out? Because I still, like we say, there's a first Friday and that's where we'll see people our age or older, you know, that will come out. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, it's interesting. So I'm in an interesting space now mm -hmm. where I, I feel like I am, I am having, is it a 180? Not quite a 360. I don't know. Like I am. It's math. I, I, right. Mm -mm. And, you know, it, <laughs> I did that great when I was in high school. Like, right. I don't, what's, what's one plus one again? I'm <laughs> uh, I, I am having a moment in my life now where um, I've been on this interesting journey the past couple of years of like, stripping myself of a lot of that baggage. Mm -hmm. um, certain people in certain religious spaces call it deconstructing. There's this argument that maybe it's not quite deconstructing, maybe it's something else, whatever. The reality is 
um, I am finding myself divorcing myself of a lot of that baggage. Um, and so because I am what a lot of people like to profess to be this public figure, uh, I do not as much allow some of those things to hinder me as much as they used to because my own work and my own research has caused me to consider that that level of conditioning may not have anything to do with anything beyond people just trying to control or people just trying to uh, create a world or society or individual or being that makes them most comfortable. Um, so the reasons why I don't go out much now is because I'm busy. Like sleep is very important to me. Like it's so, like, so it's, important. It's, it's so important. Sleep is a commodity. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it, and, and sometimes, yes, there are certain spaces that I'm just like, this ain't for me. Like, I don't know who this art is. I don't know who a little sexy red is or, or what have you. So that doesn't move me. Um, you give me, we went to a, a gathering not too long ago um, that my brother had this party. And my brother is in his late 50s, early 60s. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just realized that I am of the bridge generation. Like, I, I am that in-between from my brother's generation to, because I'm a cusp, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm a cusp millennial. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is some millennial music and some Gen Z music that I am familiar with the canary because I'm, because I have young nephews and nieces, et cetera. Um, and then I'm in this interesting Gen X pocket where there are certain kinds of music that move me. But then the generate the music of my brothers and sisters and even my parents' generation, some of the, what we call oldies, move me as well. And so if I find a space where all of that operates, then I'm mm -hmm. very happy, I'm very comfortable, I'm living my life and, and that's no issue. But when you get to some of this other stuff, like I enjoy make the stallion. Um, I ain't got her knees, but I love her <laughs> box. Mm -hmm. um, but like the sexy reds of the world, I don't know who those people are in that musical mm -hmm. movement. So those are the reasons, like the music, um, that I enjoy sleep, those are the reasons that sort of keep me from going out as much compared to these concerns around me being a preacher or me being a pastor or me being um, this individual that, that, that people have had um, a, a title and some level of authority to. Um, I, I, I am of that person that nowhere is scandalous because if I'm supposed to be doing the work of being amongst God's people, then I should be able to be anywhere among those people and, and that not be a problem. Um, so yeah, I thought that really answered your question, but yeah. Um, you mentioned, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned your brother and I know that yeah. you, you've acquired quite a few spiritual brothers on your journey. Um, but tell us about Hollis O. Sim Simon the second. Sick. Why are you doing this? Um, I, 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 this is. A, I think this is. A, um, you'll see where I'm going in a second. Tell us. Okay. Tell I us did. about Hollis O. Simon the second. Um, Hollis O'Neill Simon the second, born for my father, Hollis O'Neill Simon. Um, what is, uh, for all intents and purposes, my only biological brother. Mm -hmm. Um, I have learned in the past few years since my father died. Father and I had a lot of parallels. My father had only one biological brother. I only had one biological brother. Mm -hmm. Even though I have these other siblings from the other situations, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. But for all intents and purposes, he's my only biological brother. Um, he asked in 1992, the early 1990s, um, from complications to HIV, um, he had full blown AIDS by the time he died. He was a educator. He was a special education teacher, um, but he was also a designer. He was a painter. He made clothes for some of my siblings, for his mother, for cousins. Um, he was working um, to develop a name for himself in the fashion world. Um, he was my guide in a lot of ways. Uh, he, I mean, he was just a, he was a amazing individual, um, full of life, full of love. Um, and when he became diagnosed with HIV, he is probably one, one of the reasons why I, in, at this age of 
40 plus, 45 plus, live to the extent that I live because my brother wanted to live so bad. He was so creative. Um, when I had projects at school that did display boards, I would have him draw my display boards for my school assignment. Um, I mean, he probably was, for all intents and purposes, the first best friend I had before I knew what a best friend was. Hmm. But yeah, he was my big brother. He was your big brother. And did, did he identify as a gay man? He was. He was a black gay man he was um, a, as well. So I, I'm, I brought him up and I asked about Hollis because, one, I know how important he is to you. And I just wondered, did you ever imagine what your life would have been like if he were to, if he were alive to help you navigate through those black queer spaces, you know, through those, through the club scene, through the, you know, your first date, your first hookup, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. that. I think about that a lot. Um, it is part of the reason why the D is in my, in my name, in my signature. I, I, I learned after my brother died, he, either named me or had something to do with my naming. Um, and so to honor him and to honor his memory, um, I made my middle initial a part of my, my, my brand, my identity, my signature. Um, but there have been numerous times, especially when I was having like relationship problems. Oh my God. I'd be like, if my brother was here, um, the conversations we could have had, um, the moments we could have had when I could have just driven over to the house and then just been like, let me tell you about what this Negro did. Um, the, <laughs> I, I, I just really feel like there were these missed moments, um, especially because I wasn't, I was young when my brother died. I was 13 years old when my brother died. I was 13, he was 33. Um, and so I had not quite come, I, I knew who I was um, and I knew what my identity was but I had not been brave enough to let others in on that or let others back. Um, so he was a huge part of why I came out when I came out. Um, and I, for many years, found myself in a space of just contemplating the what ifs. Mm. Like, how, would, how would have things gone? There was a good time, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I think I've only told this to one, maybe two other people in my life. There was a period of time in my into late teens where I had uh, a health scare of my own. I, I, I had been exposed to HIV mm -hmm. from one that I was dating at the time. And so I was really, really concerned um, and had just really spiraled. I was just like, oh my God, I did the same thing my brother did. Oh my God, my family's gonna be so disappointed in me, yada, yada. I went through all of that stuff. And I had these moments of if Hollis was still here, what I have made some of these mistakes, what I have dated this person, what I have, what I have done these things and how was I going to navigate my way through after that? Thank God I was spared. Um, I was not positive. I am not positive. Um, but it, it triggered this way of just sort of being set apart. Um, and so even when you talk about these decisions that I did not make because of the life that I was chasing, like not going out as much, et cetera, et cetera. Losing my brother also had a large part in that because I wanted, and that health scare, because I wanted to, I wanted to provide a different narrative than the one people around me had been so used to. Um, and so I became the well-organized, driven, highly successful, well-attached, well-connected person that I did, especially for my family, especially for my mother and my father, because of the law of politics. Mm. Um, I needed them to look me in a different kind of way so they could say that I had done the same things that him and many others had been um, judged for doing. Mm. I think uh, I actually relate to that in the sense of, you know, the way I would move, the way I would, mm. like, even just going out, it was more so of, okay, I'm going here. I'm going to be on my best behavior because yeah. I don't want the narrative to be, well, he was down at such and such and he was there, you know, and 
you always think, oh God, what if something happened? What what is my mother yeah. gonna say? And yeah. that's you know, and it says something uh, dire happens. You are just like, oh God, is this gonna be the story yeah. that they tell my mother? Is this going to be the story, <laughs> the legacy that I'm gonna leave behind? But such and such yeah. got caught up in at this party or at this club. And but I, you know, I I love that about you and Hollis. And again, I mentioned that you pick up spiritual brothers along the way, myself included, uh, you know. And I think part of that, those moments that we get to share in those spaces become part of that bonding process. Um, because yeah. I'm thinking of a moment where I witnessed you get free one time on a dance floor. I'm not going to go oh, any Lord. further than that. Oh, but... Y'all will never let me down. <laughs> but I, will I, never let me to, down. I do want to know for you, because it, it didn't necessarily happen with me, but what, and I've been asking every all my subjects this question about the music aspect, because I'm a DJ, so I'm going to ask this. Like, what song do you remember that really set you free in in the space with your, in the queer space with other Black men? Uh Oh, my gosh. What song has really set me free? Um, <laughs> um, there, there are three that come to mind for me because they presented themselves at very different points in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so back in the day, <laughs> back in the day was Black Pack Scrub the Ground. Uh, oh. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was. Back in the day, it was that. And part of that was because of the influences of being around my sister. So I have an older sister um, who was an exotic dancer. Um, and so she introduced me to a lot of that music back in the day. Uh, okay. So it was just something about that song that whenever it came on, I was just like, I was just black and gay and free. Um, um, back that ass up um, is another one that I think was the one that came on the night that you were talking about in questioning. Um, Actually, it was the the aforementioned song, but I it was, was it was it was, but I wasn't gonna bring <laughs> it up. But yeah, <laughs> and now you, you see why. <laughs> now you see why <laughs> you acted a fool. You cut up. Your blood all that back. Here's the thing, though, for the listeners that are out there, this night that he is talking about in particular was at the end of an academic semester. Mm -hmm. And I was really strong. I was in the second year of seminary. I was in the first, I was at the end of the first semester of my second year of seminary. And I was afraid that I was going to fuck out that semester. Like that, that level of study was so rigorous. It was the hardest something I had ever done in my life, at, in my life at that time. And so I was stressed. And on this night in particular, I let these people talk me into going out. I had just gotten my grades. I had just found out that I passed this class, this one class in particular. I had all these goals for my last year of seminary. I was scared. And so I got really drunk that night. <laughs> <laughs> me and... and and before it, got a real dark that night, mm -hmm. and we let loose, and it was it was what I needed. It was a great evening. It was a great night. It was what I needed. Um, which I am grateful to have that. Um, but now these people will never let me know that. <laughs> um, Michelle, what is your take on the disappearance of black-owned queer clubs, bars in Atlanta? What is your take on that? I think it is heartbreaking. Um, I think it is unfortunate. I think it is frustrating. I think it also speaks to the reality of access. I think it speaks to this divide um, that we have in, in in society overall. You know, now now you now you down my you down my you down my road. You down my avenue um, because I do a, a lot of work around equity and mm -hmm. and supremacy, white supremacy, and the and and how it how it, it is alive and well in our society from what believe in religion to our economics, et cetera. And I think this is one example of that. Like part of the reason why we don't have these spaces is because 
we don't have access to have it. Like the city is having a boom in this real estate. And so it's hard to afford us a, a space to do something like that and to, to create an environment. And we don't have that many people in our, in our city who can afford to do it. Um, we don't have a lot of space to do it. Like, because we're getting our high rises and buildings and spaces being built, um, all of the property that could potentially be a spec for us, um, is being snatched up very quickly. And so I think it is, it is heartbreaking as speaks to the problems in our society at times to creating opportunity for such a thing and, and, and having the support, not just from the community, the community, uh, but our, our political figures, our, our leaders in the city, um, and across the city to create certain opportunities for us to have these kind of, um, um, access points. Uh, I think but what I am experiencing is that a lot of us are creating it on our own. Mm -hmm. So we're having house parties and game nights, yes. organizing events for us to get together because we crave it so much and we don't really have somewhere that is our own to really do it um, at the caliber of what it once was some years ago. Trax is gone because of the Olympics. They bought yes. all that property to attract the Olympic and got rid of a, a pop, a popular thriving black club experience. A historical uh, landmark yeah. actually. In a, in a historical landmark. So now you have what available? You have Bulldogs and what else? Um, um, the new Eagle. The new Eagle. Which, which came oh, out of. Black night of one night and it, mm -hmm. and it died in the pandemic and is now coming back. You have um, mix is, is it still there? Anymore? Mix. mix. Yeah. Well, you, <laughs> you just dated yourself, colors. <laughs> um, but I don't know too many people who go to mix anymore, and I know that crowd is a little older. Um, so you don't have many of these spaces like you used to, and I think a part of it is because we don't have the support from our leadership or the financial ability to create these spaces because they're concerned about making Atlanta something else. But there is, that conversation happens though. Like, you know, all of you rich gays need to get together and buy a building. Um, is, is it that simple? I don't think it's that simple. When you I don't think it's that it. simple, but I, but I do think it is a start. Hmm. Um, but it, it, there's something to be said for the fact that nobody is trying to do it. And it makes me wonder why nobody wants to do it. Do they, do we in the community ourselves even see any value in doing such a thing because it hasn't happened? Um, and so I don't know, but I, 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 I do think it is unfortunate and disheartening because I am fully aware, especially in the work that I'm doing now, that there is a craving for some place to build community interact, fellowship, hang out, meet up, date, drink, party, be free. Mm -hmm. um, there's not that many options. I remember a point in time when a group of us, were you a part of this conversation? When there were a group of us um, who were talking about how we were going to get people together and we were going to take over the straight club and we were just going to make the straight clubs have like gay night and we were just going to get all of our friends together and go to the popular straight club and just <laughs> party. I don't know if you were part of that conversation. I don't remember. I don't recall that. But so like a rave takeover where, yeah, where people would just. We don't come and take over this spot. Yeah. You know, they, I, I'll never, one night I was at, um, tracks and all of a sudden I just noticed like this trickling in of trickling in, in of white kids, just young white kids coming over. And next thing you know, it was a full on rave and the look of yeah the look of confusement and yes i did say confusement on everybody's faces was like what is going on but it was an organized rave takeover and huh could that happen today well see that's the thing because of progress and i raise air quotes when i say progress because of progress it's 
feels like it looks like a lot of the young people don't need anyone's permission to take up space where they, they want don't. to take up space. And they so don't. a lot of places are integrated for lack of a better word with of both gay and straight patrons and it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal so then it maybe that is the question of is it a big deal anymore because yeah. the young younger people who are really the ones that are going out aren't necessarily feeling the need to be seg- to have a safe space because they feel like they can go anywhere anyway yeah yeah that's a good point I hadn't thought about that. I don't really know where they go, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. The, some of the young, some of the young ones who are younger than me, I associate with, are the ones who will do the bulldogs, the eagle experiences. Um, there's another one that it was in my mind a few minutes ago, and I completely forgot it. Um, it may come back to me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Who I sound old. I don't know where the young people are these days. <laughs> um, so you, you make a great point. Some of them are probably hitting up the spots that they just consider to be the popular spots, regardless if they are gay, straight, or otherwise, and are perfectly okay with that. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. It's a interesting and ongoing conversation, and I'm very honored that you took the time to share your point of view with me to share your history with our listeners and to give them a perspective of the quote unquote church boy, you know, because there is that church, that church person um, arc of people here in Atlanta that have that same experience of wanting to be free, but having their, you know, their mores, their social mores and, and the the people that they associate with them always staying taking up residence in their brain yeah. and influencing those um decisions of whether or not I'm going to socialize and be around other people that I identify with and f- and can be free around so I appreciate yeah. you sharing that because yeah. somebody's going to see themselves in you uh when they yeah. hear that conversation so yes, well, thank you. That. I appreciate it. You know I love you. I you know, love you too. You know how I feel. You yes. and I will never part. And uh, hey now, we will not. Thank you for listening to I Come Alive, stories of Black Gay Atlanta nightlife. Brought to you by Q Points Productions. Special thanks to the Counter Narrative Project 2024 Media Roundtable for their support as well. Make sure you become a Q Point subscriber so that you don't miss the next episode of I Come Alive.